Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. Our topic today, the new Vortex Software Solution 6.8 version, which was released uh, two weeks ago. Uh, my name is Jean-Pierre Picard, Product Marketing Manager at CM Labs, and I'll be your host today. With me on the line is Marc Alexandre Vezna, Product Manager uh, for Vortex Software Solution, who will be handling questions during the webinar and also taking uh, some time to show us some of the features in action. Today's presentation is split in three sections. We're going to start by doing a quick recap of uh, the recent releases of Vortex Software Solution. Vortex Software Solution 6.8 is the third release of, uh, of our uh, software platform in 2016, so we're going to look at the road that's been uh, covered this year. Then we'll go through the uh, new features in uh, Ver uh, Vortex 6.8, and as you'll see, there's quite a lot of good new things in there. It's a fairly big release. And we're going to mix through this uh, presentation uh, several live demos of the main new features, the ones that you understand better by seeing them in action. Now, as usual, we're going to finish this presentation with a live Q&A. You can send your questions during the webinar, uh, and we'll be filtering those that we want to take privately or publicly uh, along the way. Now, if you have any issues with video or audio as well, you can let us know using the right hand size questions box. We've also uploaded today's presentation to the uh, GoToWebinar interface. You just have to look at the handout section. You can download the PDF. And we will be recording today's presentation and sending a uh, copy by email to everybody who's on the line. So if there's anything that you want to revisit or send to colleagues, then no worries. You'll have a direct link to the webinar. Now, I see that some people online aren't necessarily uh, familiar with Vortex or new to uh, Vortex Software Solutions. So just a quick recap of what Vortex Software Solution is. It's a CM Labs real-time visualization and simulation platform. What that means is that it's a, um, it's a set of uh, tools to create uh, simulations, including modeling, a vehicle, uh, modeling mechanism and creating environments and scenarios. Vortex Software Solutions as a desktop application, as obviously CM Labs acclaimed the Dynamics Engine uh, powering it, but also a full set of integration capabilities to third-party IG, uh, in addition to our own built-in visualization engine, but also to hardware and software solutions. Now, this set of tools means that Vortex Software Solution is used around the world for virtual prototyping, uh, but also training simulation development, uh, for example, in the uh, maritime and defense industry, and for operational planning. We're present worldwide, and we have uh, hundreds of customers who have built simulations and simulators using Vortex Software Solution. Today, we're going to show you some demos in the two uh, desktop applications that come with Vortex Software Solution. The first is the Vortex Editor. This is the application that you use to create your mechanism and your scenes, to validate them, and to create the uh, configurations that allow you to deploy them across uh, multi-channel uh, display systems. Now, we're also going to do some uh, examples in Vortex Player. Vortex Player is the uh, desktop application that's used to uh, manage uh, the uh, simulation and distribute them to uh, multiple displays and multiple participants. All right, so if we look back at uh, what was released for Vortex Software Solution in 2016, we started the year in January with Vortex 6.6. This was a fairly major release that brought uh, about uh, massive improvements to uh, simulation performance in the form of asset instancing. Asset instancing allows you to take identical assets and uh, simply define them as instances, which means that they are only loaded to memory once for scenes with a lot of elements in the, the environment or for vehicles, uh, for example, that have multiple uh, ex identical wheels, then this is great because it allows you to save a lot of uh, memory and uh, improve performance. Vortex 6.6 was also a massive change to uh, the Vortex Editor um, graphical pipeline by adding the graphics gallery. The graphics gallery provided you with control over the nodes and the, uh, and the uh, hierarchy of your models directly through the editor interface, which allowed you, allowed you to bridge the, the gap between a uh, 3D modeling solution and, uh, and uh, your simulation. Now, with that, we also added a support for CAD files and more 3D models in the form of DAE support. CAD files was a major uh, game changer for anybody using Vortex for virtual prototyping, as typically, engineering models are built in CAD. Now, the CAD uh, optimizer add-on provided a large set of tools to simplify and defeature those models and to uh, make them as efficient as possible and bring them to uh, focus really on the parts that impact performance. 
and Vortex 6.6. Also, we uh, marked the addition of support for SpeedTree assets. Uh, SpeedTree being a uh, one of the leading solutions for vegetation uh, in uh, in the three uh, D world. And since Vortex 6.6, we've been shipping with about 35 pre-optimized SpeedTree models directly in uh, Vortex. So that's uh, also very useful to uh, accelerate simulation creation. And Vortex 6.6 obviously kept uh, improving the uh, Dynamics engine that is at the core of uh, Vortex software solution with addition uh, to earthwork, cables, and marine systems. Then last summer, we launched Vortex 6.7. Vortex 6.7 continued the trend of improving visuals in, uh, in uh, Vortex software solution simulations by adding the option to uh, control texturing directly in the Vortex editor. So we built on the graphics gallery and added a new multi-texturing capabilities that allows you to fine-tune models to get a really uh, lifelike look. We've also added two new anti-aliasing methods that were both very efficient on uh, performance but provided uh, nice improvements to uh, the, uh, the visualization of lines in your uh, in your simulations, and there was a lighting uh, engine revamp, which made uh, lighting in the scene appear more realistic across the board. Vortex 6.7 also saw the introduction of the new uh, setup interface, which made uh, the uh, task of creating the configuration files for a simulator setup a lot easier. We've moved from a code-based uh, work process to a uh, graphical user interface that made it easier to ramp up new employees, but also to manage existing configurations. And Vortex 6.7 brought about enhancement to vehicles in the form of automatic transmissions modeling. It, this brings us to Vortex 6.8, which again uh, brings some improvements to vehicle modeling. This time in the form of art and soft ground tire models. Now, as you'll see in a few minutes, these provide uh, enhanced behavior uh, modeling on uh, different types of grounds. 6.8 also uh, introduces um, scene and mechanism configurations, which will allow you to uh, more efficiently create variations of, uh, of the same simulation scenes and mechanisms. We're going to see how these help you save time and build uh, more flexible, adaptable scenarios. And finally, Vortex 6.8 introduces a new level of detail configuration option that makes it easier to create large environments that scale uh, efficiently in terms of uh, visuals rendering. So let's get started with enhanced vehicle modeling, uh, probably the flagship uh, improvement in Vortex 6.8. If you've been using Vortex uh, to, uh, to model uh, mechanism uh, vehicles that are uh, track or wheel based, you'll know that we take what we call a component based mo modeling approach compared to other solution which used a scripted approach. What that means is that you take the uh, engineering specifications of your vehicle and you apply them to simulate individual components of the vehicle, including the engine, the transmission, the differential, the brakes, the chassis, the steering, and of course the wheels and tracks. What this does is it simulates uh, the performance much more accurately because each part of the vehicle is uh, simulated and it creates a whole system. Other solutions will have you script uh, the acceleration and the uh, braking and then you will have something that is uh, literally uh, gamed. It's not, a, it's not a full simulation. Now, in 6.7 and uh, earlier, you were simulating uh, wheel ground interaction through uh, the uh, materials table, which meant that you could uh, simulate different uh, different uh, properties for traction, but they were all using the same model, which was the Coulomb friction model. What this resulted uh, was in a, um, a fairly accurate uh, performance uh, simulation on uh, hard ground materials, but it, you could see some limitations on soft ground materials. So what are hard and soft ground materials? Hard ground materials are kind of like the highway. You know, you drive on them, it will maintain its shape regardless of the interactions. If you have a big uh, truck or a smaller car, uh, uh, regardless of how you brake, asphalt or concrete will not deform. So the traction changes are based on the material properties and not on the shape of the ground. This uh, we provided fairly good, uh, very very accurate um, simulation even in Vortex 6.7. Now, if you went to soft ground materials, uh, we provided good simulation of the traction, but there were some limitations in the fact that soft ground materials can lose their shape in real life, and that affects the performance of the vehicle. And that changes the traction based on the deformation because your uh, ground can push back against your wheels when you are starting to get uh, synced in. We could approximate that, but without simulating full uh, ground deformation, we were not getting uh, as accurate a result as we wanted. We decided to push the envelope further on this uh, aspect. 
That's where we introduce. Uh, that's why we introduce tire models. Primarily, this increases realism of vehicle simulations. You get to choose different simulation models per material. So for hard ground, you get to choose between Magic Formula, Fiala, and Composite Slip. And the one that you will uh, select is based on the uh, data that you have available and your own experience uh, with uh, those models. Now, each of these models have uh, advantages and uh, inconvenience based on the data you have. So the, the choice is yours for which one you want to leverage. Soft ground, we provide five models. And again, these, uh, the one you will use will depend on personal preference and available data. In addition to those new models, we've also added uh, modeling for tire pressure, which really uh, helps uh, create new uh, behavior simulations. So this provides you with richer immersion behavior. So you can simulate flats because you can simulate changes in uh, tire pressures. You can simulate drifting, slipping on uh, soft materials, spin outs, you can get stuck in the ground. So you get a whole new range of behaviors that can be simulated naturally based on the properties of the ground and your uh, mechanism components. And it also provides you easier management because now once you create your reference uh, tire models and you've selected their, uh, their um, simulation model, set up their properties, you can copy and paste them through multiple mechanisms. So that's a real time saver because you don't have to restart over every time. The way they work is that uh, it's part of Vortex Vehicle Systems, which is an add-on for, uh, which is a module of Vortex Software Solution. Now we're replacing the material table with this, and each tire model that you create can use a different simulation model. So you could create a hard tire model with uh, the uh, composite slip model uh, simulation model, and you could create also one for uh, sand uh, driving that used a uh, Becker simulation model. All of these are independent. You select one tire model per material. So instead of mapping uh, properties between wheel and different tire model, uh, yeah, tire models, then you select uh, one tire model per uh, material uh, that you uh, you would have added in your material table. So I'm going to switch the controls to Mark Alexander. It's going to show us uh, tire models in action. Mark Alexander, here you go. Thank you, GP. So I've opened up the uh, LEV mechanism that comes with the sample of Vortex 6.8 just to show you a uh, tire system, a tire model system in place already. So we have our vehicle system in the Explorer, and I'm opening it up. We have our dynamic component, our connection, just like we had before, but now there's a new entry called tire model component just underneath. These are automatically inserted uh, whenever you use a, a wheeled vehicle template. If you do not have a... Um, if you have an older model that doesn't have a tire model component, all is not lost. I'm opening up the uh, LEV from the 6.7 sample, and you can see there's no tire model here. So if you right-click on the uh, vehicle system, you'll see that there's a, an option called Add Tire Model Component that we just click on, and it's going to add a tire model component to the existing vehicle system, and then you can set it up, as we'll see uh, shortly. So now that we have a, a tire model component in our vehicle system, uh, there is a number of entries. Wheel collection is the wheel adapter that connect the uh, vehicle to the tires. Uh, tire type collection is the, uh, the tires themselves. And the default tire models is something that is going to be used by the system if you do not define a tire type for a given uh, terrain surface. So let's check the first one. Wheel collection, this is automatically created based on your vehicle uh, dynamic component. So in this case, we've got eight wheels. The system's read that the vehicle has eight wheels, so it automatically created eight uh, wheel adapter. Each wheel adapter has a number of entries. Uh, two input, the first one is the tire type, which we're going to create a little later and the tire pressure. You'll notice that in this case I've linked the tire pressure to a VHL uh, to be able to change it and emulate a central tire inflation system. Uh, below this you see that each wheel adapter has quite a few outputs. All of these are generated at runtime based on the uh, on the simulation. So it tells you the ground material currently in contact, the normal force, the compliance. All of these can be used to either drive additional scripting, uh, drive information displayed on screen, or they can be uh, saved later for uh, analysis, for example. Now that you've set up your wheel collection, we need to set up the tires themselves. So there is a folder called tire type collection. And what we do, we right click on it, 
and we can add tire type. What this is going to do is that it's going to create a new tire. And within that tire type, I just rename it up here, we're going to add new tire models. And we want to have a tire model for each kind of ground surface that is present in our scene. So you have your choice between, as uh, GP mentioned, composite slip, fila, and magic formula for hard ground. And you also have the standard Coulomb model. And you also have a tire model for soft ground. So once you've added them, you're going to have something that looks like this. So in this case, I've got one for the road. I've I, re I renamed it road. I selected the uh, material from the list. This list is populated by the material table of your scene. So you got to make sure that you have a material table loaded uh, before you set this up. Then we have the rolling resistance model. This is set in this case for the tire pressure, but I could also derive it from speed. Or if you have experimental data, you can also insert it as a, in the form of a data table. And then there's a number of uh, settings that uh, you need to input. All of these are based on experimental data, labor, uh, laboratory data. So in this case, we use a Fiela tire model because that's the data we had for asphalt. So that's what we did. If we use a soft terrain tire model, it's going to look a bit different. So in this case, I use a soft terrain model for the sand material. You first choose your uh, stress model. So we have the choice between Becker, Wong, Reese, Muskeg, or Snow. You set up your log uh, internal shearing model. So either exponential hump model or Wong model, depending on the data you have. Same thing for the external. Again, the rolling resistance based on speed table or tire pressure. And then you have a number of data points that you need to enter for the, uh, the model, again, based on uh, experimental data. So it's fairly important that you choose a model for which you have uh, data. And then you go ahead and you create a, uh, a, tire, uh, for, uh, a tire model for each of the surface in your scene. And then at the end, you have a model. And this tire can then be copied over to new models. So you don't have to redo the work again and again uh, whenever you set up multiple vehicles. So let's go to the uh, defense vehicle scene, which comes from the, uh, the sample of uh, Vortex. And what we're going to do is that we're going to try and drive over sand. Now, I've set up the sand surface here as not just a sand-covered material, but actually a big pile of sand to really show how the vehicle will get bogged down into it. So in the Explorer panel at the left, I go to the driver and I activate the driver role. So now I'm sitting inside the vehicle. I'm going to launch the simulation using the, uh, the play button up here. And then I'm going to grab my controls. And then the vehicle is now loaded. And then we're going to go outside the vehicle so that we can see the, uh, the wheel a little bit better. And then we're just going to drive forward a bit. So the vehicle is starting to move. And sorry if I'm not rolling very fast. So in this case, we could have a, uh, an interaction with the soil. If we had a wet asphalt, for example, the vehicle would be able to slip and slide. Uh, you could drift with it. You could do uh, whenever you brake, you're going to see it uh, skid across the surface. Now, when I go over from a hard surface to a soft surface, you're going to see the wheel start digging into the ground. And then we're going to go up a hill. And I'm going to try and go closer to the wheel. And then when we try to go up the hill, we see that the wheels are starting to slip. So this wheel is slipping, actually. And power is not transmitted very uh power is transmitted accurately. So you can see that my wheel up front is spinning into the sand, but it's not actually finding any purchase. So we're going to slide down the hill a bit, and we're going to try again. This time, I'm going to lock my differential and try to give some power to the wheel. And you can see that the wheels are slipping over the surface, and they're actually digging into it. If you make a soil that's really soft, you're actually going to see the, uh, the tire uh, 3D model uh, sink into the surface. So you can see that the wheels are, can't find any purchase over the soft sand. 
Now, in this case, we've added a, uh, a script to generate some particle uh, so that you can see it better. These can be uh, tuned to accurately represent a real uh, sand projection, if you will. Particle are fairly expensive in terms of simulation, but they do create great visual. Back to you, GP. Thank you, Marc Alexandre. So now that brings us to our second major improvement to uh, Vortex 68. Those of you who have created simulations that are used for uh, operator training will probably be familiar with uh, the uh, challenges involved with maintaining uh, multiple uh, copies of the same scenes or mechanism because you have uh, slightly slight variations to the uh, layout of those scenes. Uh, sometimes you just want to change a few things to make it conducive to a, a separate training. So, for example, let's take our uh, mobile crane sample. As it is uh, delivered with uh, Vortex uh, 6.7 and 6.8, your mobile crane is located at the top of the hill and it's set up to uh, try lifting a, a concrete pipe. So that's great, you get to uh, familiarize yourself with the uh, controls, but what happens when you want to create a second scenario? Maybe one where you actually place the pipe in a trench that you would like to dig here, and you'd like to remove those blockers so you can actually drive the, um, the mobile crane uh, there. And you want to keep the mobile crane uh, in the uh, location because you want them to uh, lift the, uh, the pipe and then drive down. Now, to do that, you will need to create a second scene and keep it uh, separate. That means that if you make modifications to the environment, maybe you have some new nicer graphics to go around, maybe you have some uh, new textures, then you need to update both files. And the same happens for uh, a lot of uh, little elements like that. Now, that also means that you have a uh, fairly strict uh, simulation uh, model uh, for your uh, trainers in that they open a file and then they can only practice whichever scenario you get in there. So that's why we're introducing Vortex configurations. What they are is they're user-activated presets that can modify our simulation is set up at load time. So it can modify the content, and you can use this to add, modify, or remove Vortex objects directly in the Vortex editor or in the Vortex player. So these presets uh, allows you to modify in mechanism, for example, the assemblies, the graphics galleries, the extensions, and the roles uh, present in your simulation. And at the scene level, you can uh, modify mechanism positions and their properties. So you could decide that uh, your uh, mobile crane is located elsewhere to begin with by activating a different uh, configuration. You can also modify uh, scene level graphic galleries, extensions, and roles. Now, these are easily accessible. You might have noticed this little corner at the top left of the uh, editor interface during Mark Alexandre's demo. That is where you create and activate uh, configurations in the editor. Now, we're going to see how we can create and uh, define those in a moment, but you can also easily access them in the Vortex player. So there is a new tab in the player uh, console that shows you all active uh, or potentially active uh, mechanism configuration and also scene configurations. And then you get to activate the ones that you want for uh, your uh, specific session. So in action, it will look a bit something like this. You activate a, um, a, uh, a configuration and you modify exactly what's in your uh, scene uh, in real time. Now this is done at load time and then you get to start your uh, simulation uh, for uh, for uh, your trainees. So I'm going to pass the control back to Marc Alexandre who's going to show us how to create and configure those uh, configurations. Marc Alexandre. Thank you GP. So I've opened up the uh, forklift sample from Vortex 6.8. Now you'll notice if you're familiar with the uh, the Vortex sample, you'll notice that there's a new panel up here on the left at the mechanism level. This is not always open. Uh, if you want to, you can open it up from the, uh, the view windows and you can either display it through here. And of course it's undockable like the rest. Now the configuration shows you, the uh, panel shows you the configuration that are available for your mechanism. So in this case, I've set up some very simple one to change the uh, the color of the rear chassis of the vehicle. Now, how, how this was done is that when I activate the uh, configuration, if you see in the property panel, there's an object and an action, and you can add objects uh, to a configuration. This is an interface, and this interface is in the graphic gallery, and what it does is that it, it uh, controls the color 
of the vehicle. So when I added it to the configuration, I set it to modify. So whenever the configuration is active, whatever changes I make are remembered by that configuration. So when I deactivate it, it's saved uh, inside the, uh, the file. So in this case, what I did is that I added the interface to the configuration by right clicking on it. So I added to a configuration. I went and I activated it. Then I went back to my interface. I changed the color here. And when I was done, I just unclicked to save it. So now I can go to a blue color. Now, you can also add objects to a new configuration or also to existing configuration. So when you click on this, it's going to ask you to select a configuration because you can have multiple objects within a configuration as long as they do not come into conflict with each other. For example, in this case, I've modified the color. If I click on a second configuration, obviously the forklift cannot be blue and green at the same time. So you're going to get a pop-up telling you, well, do you want to stay with the current configuration or do you want us to go with the new one? And then it's going to go to the new one. Now, in configuration, there are three possible actions, which are modify, which we just saw, also add and modify, and remove. Now, what these do, uh, we'll start with a fairly uh, obvious one, which is remove. So I go to the human figure in the cabin, and I add it to a new configuration, so it appears up here. So you just rename it operator, for example. Now I've got my operator in the cabin. It's set to modify. So I could do uh, modify its position, the way uh, the gesture it's having, doesn't really matter. But in this case, I want to show you the remove. So whenever the configuration is active, that object will be removed from the simulation altogether. So if I uncheck it, my operator is back. Check it again, the operator is gone. I can also do add and modify. If I do add and modify, it's the reverse. So in this case, when the configuration is active, the object is added to the simulation. If the uh, simulation, uh, if the configuration is inactive, the object is not present in the simulation. I click on it, the operator is back, and since it's modify as well as add, I could also modify its position. I can have multiple configuration active at the same time, as long as they do not come into conflict with one another. So in this case, for example, the operator can be present and the chassis can be blue because they're two different objects. If my operator was also in the blue chassis, then there would be a conflict and I would not be able to have the two configuration open at the same time. That's for the mechanism level. If we go at the scene level, and first I'm going to turn down the uh, default light. So at the scene level, you also have your configuration panel up here, but these are for the configuration at the scene level, not at the mechanism level. So you're going to ask, where are the, the, uh, the configuration for the mechanism? Well, if you go into the Explorer and you open your mechanism, you'll see that they're listed as objects within the mechanism. And yes, this means that you can add a mechanical configuration to a scene configuration, either a new one or an existing one. So in this case, for example, I can go and activate a mechanism configuration or deactivate it. And I can also add it to an existing configuration, for example, box loaded on forklift. And then I go here and then I activate the this one and the scene configuration has moved because the box here, the movable crate mechanism, is set to modify. So I've modified its position to place it on the forklift skid. And it's possible to change the, uh, the, uh, the color as well. I need to go into the color. I need to activate it. And then I load it. And now my forklift is blue and it's got the crate on it. Uh, you can also go back and use the scene configuration to change the position of the forklift. So if I put the forklift here, my forklift is over there. And if I click on this, my box is also moved to its new position, but the forklift obviously is not there anymore. I click on it, the forklift is back. So using different objects, you can create a number of starting configuration for your scene and your mechanism that are going to make them more useful to you. At the player level, so if I open the uh, the player here, 
uh, as GP mentioned, uh, there's a tab called configuration here where you'll find configuration. First though, you've got to load your scene. So I'm just gonna click on load. And now my scene is loaded. If I go into configuration, now I've got the configuration for my mechanism and the configuration for my scene. So if you open them up, you can see them and then you can control the activation from here. So activate, deactivate at the player level. Back to you, GP. Thank you, Mark Alexandre. All right. So moving on, we get to the uh, third uh, major um, theme of uh, Vortex 68's release, and that is the uh, increase in the environment, environment rendering scalability. So if you looked at uh, simulation in Vortex 6.7, 6.6, and prior, um, you would see that uh, you know you can have objects in the distance, but you had limited options to manage how much resources you spent to rendering them. Now, if we look at this uh, example here, which is from our offshore sample, you can see the the, uh, the vessel uh, in the distance. Now, we're just going to really fast move towards it. And as you'll see, there's a lot of details to our model. Now, you have handrails, you have uh, the struts here, you have a lot of details that are loaded, but they're actually present even when you're super far away, when you cannot see them. And you can see them, you know, only when you get around, around to this point. So, we're spending resources rendering these details, which are necessary because this ship will actually be closer to our point of view later on in the um, in the uh, webinar. Uh, sorry, in the uh, simulation. Now, with 6.8, we're adding a new level of object uh, level of detail uh, feature that allows you to defeature objects based on distance. So this year we have a very exaggerated example, but as you we zoom out, you can see that we have some detailed elements that disappear normally, and then when you get far away, it disappears completely. Normally, you set it in a way that the details will fade in uh, at a point where you would not quite yet see them in the operator's point of view. So that transition will be seamless. And then as uh, they move away, they would, they would disappear again at a point where they don't really see it anymore. But you will not be spending any more resources uh, on rendering those details. You set level of details uh, at the uh, graphic nodes level. Now, level of details allow you to modify uh, three elements. The first is shadows. You can def define if your graphic node casts or receives shadows. Since shadows are, uh, are um, fairly uh, resource consuming, then this is great because you could set a uh, particular piece to cast shadow if they cast a long shadow that is visible from the operator point of view, but not receive it because those details will not be viewed at a distance. You can also modify the model's mesh to reduce the polygon count. This is what we did in the uh, video we were looking at where we removed uh, the handrails and the struts uh, from uh, the model. This simplified the model at fewer polygon counts and uh, meant that you were spending less energy rendering those polygons. And finally, you can modify graphic materials and you have a lot of options there. You can change textures to have lower resolution textures at a distance. You can also reduce the layer count by removing things such as uh, normal mapping uh, at a uh, distance. Now, if you're working with models that already have level of details, you can import them uh, if they're in open, open Colada or OSG uh, file format. Um, I invite you to refer yourself to the documentation, however, because there are some uh, work to be done if, you, uh, if you're using OSG before you import them. So just make sure that you have your model lined up properly. So we're going to switch the controls to Mac OS, and we're going to show us how to configure these uh, in, uh, the, in our uh, simulation. Thank you, GP. So I've opened up the uh, graphic gallery of the Norman Kraken model. And as you can see, the uh, it's a fairly detailed ship with lots of tiny handrails. The thing is, when we scroll back in the distance, the handrails quickly vanish because they're so small that you can barely see them at a distance. So the computer struggles to render them and it's kind of a waste of processing power. So what we want to do is uh, make sure that we don't attempt to render them at a distance. So if we go to the, uh, the node, the graphic node for the ship itself, we now have a, uh, the, the familiar inputs, the transform, visible, receive fog, but now the level of detail, instead of being just one single distance like it used to be, now includes a, uh, several different uh, subsections which you can control with the, uh, the size field here. So by clicking on field, increasing the size, you're adding level of detail. In general, uh, 
three or four level of detail is more than enough for what you're doing. So there's no need to go uh, crazy and add 10, 15 level of details. Now the first level of detail is our ship as we expect it to be. So a fully detailed mesh. So if we go to the mesh here, well, sorry, we can see that the mesh is fairly complex with all the handrail and everything in it. Go back to the, uh, the ship. And the graphic material is also fairly uh, detailed. It's got reflection. It's got an emission layer for some of the, uh, the surface. Uh, complex albedo. We've got a window mask to make the, uh, the window look shiny uh, and different from the paint. There's a specular layer. There's a lot of things going on. And these take up processing power. And also it casts shadow and it receives shadow. So all this is very costly. We want to have uh, something that's a little easier to see. So I'm going to change the actual distance to 20 meters. So it's going to switch earlier to the next level. So if we go to the next level, you're going to see that the uh, handrails and the stairs have vanished. So what happened here is that it moved to the second level. So we have another mesh and another graphic material. So if I go see that mesh, you'll notice that there's no handrail and no stairs. Uh, in the same vein, the uh, graphic material for this one doesn't have interrun reflection. It only has one level, uh, one layer of texture on it, uh, which is the diffuse. So it doesn't have uh, albedo, specular, uh, it doesn't have specular, gloss, emissive, and so on. So we're going to change the distance again, like this, and this one doesn't receive shadow. And then we go to the next level, it uses the same mesh and material, but this time it doesn't cast or receive shadow. And if I wanted to, I could put a fourth level where there's nothing, and the ship will actually disappear at that distance. So how did I do this? Um, there's two ways to do it. The first one is to go back to your uh, 3D artist and say, uh, please give me a mesh that is simplified. And when you get to the, uh, the material, please use less texture for additional level. The uh, distance itself is going to be set by uh, trial and error to see uh, how far the detail disappear on the screen. There's a second way to do it, and this is what I've actually done here, is that I uh, made a duplicate of this node here to create a uh, duplicate of the mesh itself. And then I used the, uh, the CAD importer tool to break down this graphic node and the associated mesh into several smaller nodes. So when I did this, all the end rails became uh, uh, separate nodes, all the decking and so on. And then I started picking off elements and just re removing them from the model. Once this was done, I saved it. Then I just simply deleted the graphic, the extra graphic node, but I did not uh, remove the, uh, the mesh here. So I saved my mesh and then I went back to my original graphic node and I just inserted it in my level of detail uh, field right here. And now I have a ship that takes a lot less processing power at a distance and but still looks uh, realistic. Back to you, GP. Thank you, Mark Alexandre. All right, so before we move on to the Q&A, there is also a handful of uh, other improvements to Vortex Software Solution that I would like to go over. The first one is uh, the new connections graph. So those of you who have worked on, uh, on simulations where mechanisms have a lot of connections, uh, for example, uh, if you look at the, um, at the uh, forward or sample, you'll know that uh, a list of connections can quickly get uh, fairly tricky to manage. And it's not so bad if you're the one who created that list originally and you're working on it. You know how it's set up. But if you're trying to open up an existing mechanism and modify the uh, connections, sometimes it's very hard to get around. You have to spend a good amount of time looking at the list, understanding what's happening. So the connections graph uh, was uh, came about as a, um, as a um, solution to reduce the time spent on creating connections, but also making it easier to visualize existing connections and their relationship to each other and to the different uh, behaviors of the vehicle. We also were aiming at harmonizing our conventions with industry standards so that new employees would get uh, in uh, the Vortex Editor, open up connections, and immediately know how to use it. And that's what Connections Graph uh, does. What it does, it's a graphical interface that allows you to create drag and drop connections uh, directly in a um, in a kind of a visual map. Now, 
this uh, map allows you to also automatically organize existing connections so that you will uh, fit them and see their relationship a lot more uh, clearly. They provide also tools such as frames that allow you to add information to your connection so that somebody opening it up would understand exactly what's happening. And going a step further, uh, we've also color-coded the different connection types based on the data uh, type that is sent between those connections. So I'm going to pass the controls to Marc Alexandre, who's going to show us the connections graph in action uh, using uh, some existing samples. Marc Alexandre. Thank you, GP. So for this, I'm going to use the uh, one of my favorite uh, sample model, the uh, forestry forwarder. Now, the forwarder is a fairly complex vehicle. It's got two chassis linked together. It's got a uh, crane with a claw on the end. It's got a movable cabin. It's got a lot of bells and whistles on it. And of course, our connection uh, editor is huge. So there's 88 connection in this model and it creates a huge list and it's very hard to read. So in Vortex 6.8, what we did is that we have added an option and I'm using the little uh, arrow here to show it, which is called a node graph view. And what it, this does is that it creates a visual uh, representation of all these connection inside the model so you can track better what is what in how things are attached. Now, in this case, uh, everything is in one big connection container. So we've got our joystick here, which sends data to a forwarder interface, and then also to the uh, joystick here. And all of these can be moved, obviously. They can be uh, resizes, resized like this, so you can read them better. So here we've got the joystick sending output to a script, which is sending information for velocity to inches and other uh, constraint. Now, it helps a lot to uh, better read the model, but it's still fairly complex. So there's a couple of things that you can do to uh, make this a little easier to read. You can either move stuff around like this. You can also, by right-clicking on it, add a frame to it. So in this case, it's the HUD controls. I'm just typing the title and then we're going to have a frame around it. And now you can move them as a unit and you can also move the boxes within this. And you'll notice that the uh, the lines are color coded according to the type of data that's been transferred from one to the other. And I, if I really want to clean this up, what I can do also is just take this and move it to a new connection container altogether, which I'm going to call HUD connections, for example. I'm just going to click on it. And now I've got it as a separate container, which only contains some basic uh, information about the uh, uh, so I've left some behind. I'm going to go back to the uh, forwarder 68 because I've already done all the cleanup for connection container here. So that huge container that you had before, I split it up into something that's a little easier to see. So there's one for steering, one for driving, one for the wheels, one for the crane. So if I take the crane, for example, now Everything that's related to the crane is located in this diagram, and it's a lot easier to read because now you can see the inputs, where the controls are going, which one are going to the script, which one are going to the uh, to the constraint, and so on. And all of this, this is all uh, you can all connect them like this. They're all uh, it's all drag and drop, connect, unconnect, and it's very easy to use. Back to you, GP. Thank you, Marc Alexandre. So I'd like to invite anybody with questions. Start sending us uh, to them using the right-hand side's questions interface. I see that a few of them have come in, and we're going to start the live Q&A in a few minutes. Just before we get there, some additional improvements uh, in Vortex 68. The first one being a new weather engine. Now, the new weather engine uh, provides more realistic uh, precipitations for snow and rain and provides you with more control over the uh, graphic materials used by rain, by snow, so you get to actually uh, tweak it based on your scene. We've also added a new customizable cloud coverage option, and as you can see here, there's a lot of new cloud models that you can use. This is especially relevant for maritime simulation where uh, you want to have a certain type of clouds that will represent certain type of weather that is either ongoing or coming up. 
We've also added a new cable holder tool. Now this one's interesting because if you've modeled um, mechanisms that manipulate cables, you'll know how tricky it is to create a, a grasper that can uh, properly uh, grab a cable but doesn't uh, consume a lot of resources trying to resolve those contacts. Now if I play this video here of uh, a cable, uh, cable grabber tool, you can see that as soon as uh, there is contact, there is a uh, collision that happens to push the cable out. You could create a grasper that will grab the cable properly, but it will take a very high uh, amount of resources because you'll be resolving a ton of uh, contacts every uh, single time step. Now, the cable holder tool allows you to specify a, um, a part as a cable manipulator. And as soon as there is a contact between that part and the cable, then uh, you will be uh, stopping the um, contacts uh, resolution and it will stick to the, to the part. This is a much more efficient way to uh, simulate uh, cable uh, holding tools. We've also added a new cable spooler uh, tool, uh, an extension, uh, which allows you to define a part as a cable spooler and then you can uh, winch cables in and out. If you look at the Norman Kraken here in 6.7, you can see that the cable here went back inside a box and in that box to be able to simulate a winch we had to add a uh, cylinder uh, and then define it as a winch. This was time consuming and not the best way to simulate it because there is not an actual cylinder uh, that we see. Now in 6.8 you can actually define this box as a cable spooler and the cable will uh, attach to it and will be able to winch in and out without further work. And finally, we've also uh, added a new underwater silt uh, uh, engine that allows you, again, to control the uh, details of uh, your, uh, your particles. You get to define the, um, the graphic materials you're using and you have more controls over the intensity and uh, the look of silt. And you can see here this is very realistic. Now, as usual, all documentation was updated for Vortex Software Solutions 6.8, including the user guide, sample guide, the release notes. I invite you to have a look at the release notes because there are also a lot of small uh, changes and improvements that we can't cover in this webinar that are still very interesting to uh, know about. And samples were updated as usual. Now, if you want to see some of the new features we've talked about today, the defense vehicle is definitely the best one to look at tire models. You've got uh, very advanced tire models uh, set up on the LAV. Uh, the forklift in the warehouse is a great way to get familiar with configurations. And the offshore sample, because of its long uh, distances, is great for the level of details. I invite you to look at the samples guide to see uh, each feature that are showcased in, uh, those, uh, in those samples as well. Now, I'd like to invite you, before we move on to question, to sign up for uh, next week's uh, Vortex University webinar on simulation performance optimization. Uh, you can visit the URL displayed on the screen uh, to sign up. And uh, in uh, that uh, session, we'll spend an hour looking at how you, how you can uh, troubleshoot simulation performance using uh, Vortex Editor and Vortex Player tools, but also some general best practices to ensure the good performance of your simulations. If you're not familiar with Vortex University, it is a, a webinar series in which every month we take a topic, and uh, typically a very technical topic, and we do a deep dive on this topic. So we've covered, for example, the creation of cables, earthwork zones, uh, vehicles, so I invite you to look at our YouTube page to see past sessions and sign up for upcoming sessions at the URL on the screen. So we're now going to move on to the uh, Q&A. 